let me just say this before I start the questions, Dean Hayes. Forty years ago, I would love to have had you as my professor <laughs> in graduate study with your perspective on the Holy Scriptures. I'm telling you. I met a young man over here who's headed to Duke Divinity School this next fall, Alex Parker, right here. Hey. And I met just uh, in the hour before Daniel Lumpy. I hope I'm saying that right. Daniel, where are you? I, I, he's somewhere around. But Daniel is also a, a new, relatively new student at Duke Divinity School. How blessed these young men and the women who are there are to be able to study with you, not only as a professor, but also as a dean at that great school. All right, we're just going to start off with the first one on the stack. How does figural reading relate to types, quote, unquote, that was so dear to the Bible searchers of the past like Sir Robert Anderson? What I'm calling, uh, what Auerbach called figural reading, and it's the term I've adopted here tonight, is very closely related to what was meant by types and typology. Uh, they're, they're essentially synonymous. The thing that's, the, if there's a distinction, it would be this, that in many cases, uh, the defenders of uh, typology in the Bible have often pressed the historical factuality of both poles of the type. And I don't think all the examples that you can find of this in the Bible depend upon a historical factuality of the earlier text. What matters is that there's, they're both narratives, they're both uh, images of some sort. I mean, a good example really would be uh, the, the example I gave about the gathering uh, under the wings. I mean, you know, that's, that's a, a metaphorical description of, of God's action. It's not, a, it's not a description of some kind of uh, ev particular event in history. So I'm not sure that, that that's necessarily uh, ingredient in the use of the term typology, but what I'm talking about really is essentially the same thing. I, I simply prefer Auerbach's term figural interpretation because I think it sort of gets beyond some of the old debates about the distinction between typology and allegory. I think the definition of those terms uh, has gotten very convoluted in the scholarly discussion, and I'm just trying to kind of re-jumpstart the discussion by appealing uh, to a different set of terms. Good. This, uh, this question goes hand in hand with that one. Maybe you just want to say I've already answered it. Uh, please explain the difference between the figural reading of the Old Testament as compared to the allegorical reading that started with people such as Origen. Uh, yeah, well, I think there, there is a difference there. The, the, I won't give you a long, a long disquisition about allegory. Um, very often, allegorical interpretation as practiced both by Philo of Alexandria first and then later by Origen and by other church fathers operated in a way that didn't really pay much attention to the original narrative sense. A, a perfect example is that when Philo reads the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, he takes Sarah and Hagar as symbols for sort of different types of character qualities in an individual, different virtues or vices of one sort or another. That's an allegorical reading, but it's, it really is an abstraction away from the particularity of these people as actual people, as characters in a story. And uh, so that's the, that's the main distinction. Um, allegory I mean, in its root sense, allegory just means uh, the uh, sort of leading into a different meaning. Um, now, all these texts, uh, both allegory, typology, figural reading, they all involve finding more or finding a different meaning in an earlier story. But the way the term allegory came to be used, it often had this sort of non-narrative, non-historical sense where it pointed to various kinds of abstractions. So that would be the main difference. Okay. Here's another one. We can follow the New Testament example of figurative reading, but are there guidelines to follow as we make connections that the New Testament does not 
so that we don't abuse the Old Testament or New Testament for the sake of our own imagination when we may be going beyond authorial intent? Yeah. When, when are we? I guess he's asking. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great question. It's a very important question. I mean, the first thing to say is authorial intent is a slippery thing. It's not easy to know uh, in some of these examples what is Luke's authorial intent. What was the authorial intent of the author of Genesis or whatever? That, that is in itself an imaginative construction on our part of one sort or another. But, but I, I, it, I take that as a serious question. The question, read me the first sentence again. I've already lost it. You've lost the card. <laughs> it, had, it had to do, what are the criteria or what are the guidelines? What are the, what are the if you will, the controls on a reading that keep us from simply indulging in sort of fanciful uh, interpretation. Um, and, and indeed, interpretation that could be not only fanciful, but perhaps even harmful. And I, I, it's not easy to answer that question simply. There are certain basic things we can say. Number one, the cross and resurrection of Jesus are at the heart of the matter. And any interpretation that we give that is what I'm calling a figural reading has to read, come to the texts through that lens of the story of Jesus as uh, focused on the cross and resurrection and providing the center, the center of gravity for everything we want to say. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that these readings have to respect uh, continuity with the people Israel and the story of Israel. Uh, they, can't, they can't simply turn out to be flat-footed rejections of God's faithfulness to Israel. Any figural reading that would deny God's faithfulness to Israel, I would say, is an unfaithful reading. But finally, I think, uh, as we were saying after yesterday's panel discussion, this kind of reading is a skill. It's an art. It's like asking yourself, what is it like? How, how do you know what a, a good job of playing the violin is as compared to a bad job. If, you've, if you're a skilled violinist, you're part of a community of practice that over time learns how to play this very difficult instrument in such a way that you not only can play the right pitches that are written on the, in the notes on the page, but increasingly so that you're not just sawing away at the pitches, but you're actually performing sensitively. My nine-year-old granddaughter is just learning to play the violin. This is a very painful experience <laughs> for, this is why this example comes to mind, I think. But she's, you know, she's in a school that has a wonderful orchestra, and over time, if she continues to participate with the teachers in that orchestra, she's going to get better and better. And she's not only going to play the right notes, but she's going to play them in a way that is imaginatively sensitive. And reading the Bible well is kind of like that. It's like learning to play an instrument well, and you do that by being a participant in a community that has been working for a very long time, both about learning how to do that and in creating the standards for what a good performance is as opposed to a bad one. That's a, it's a, it's an analogy. But it's, I think it's that kind of a thing. We check our readings against our brothers and sisters in Christ and against communities of Christ that are actually bearing the fruits of the Spirit and say, how are they reading the Bible? And if my reading of the Bible is consistent with and endorsed by the testimony of these communities, then I think it's probably a good reading of the Bible. Good answer. Here's uh, the next question. How does intertextuality within the Old Testament itself inform our understanding of New Testament figural reading? Question mark. Example, mm -hmm. Psalm 8 and Genesis 1 to 2. Mm -hmm. And then one more part. How do you think it shaped the methodologies and readings of the New Testament authors? Yeah, it's another great question, and I actually think it's right on target. I, I think that there are continuities in this, the kinds of interpretation that you see in the Old Testament. I mean, here's another great example. <coughs> the Exodus story. Isaiah takes up the Exodus story and uses it figuratively 
as a metaphorical way of talking about Israel's return from exile in a later historical period. So you see that kind of thing going on in the New Testament. Uh, there's a wonderful book on this uh, by Michael Fishbane. Uh, I'm blanking the name of Fishbane. Biblical, what is it, Danny? You know, you know the book I'm thinking about? It's, it's, but, you know, it's, it's a study of exactly this kind of intertextuality internal to the Old Testament Scriptures themselves. And you do see that kind of practice going on, and that's where, in a sense, the New Testament writers uh, learned to do it. When Hosea says, out of Egypt have I called my son, he's reminding Israel, unfaithful Israel, uh, of uh, God's past faithfulness to Israel, but also holding out hope for God's restoration of Israel in the future. Uh, so it's, it's really shot through the whole biblical tradition. Uh, what was the, have, you, have you lost the second part of the question? Because I have. There was, there, was a, there, was a second, there was a second part to it. Let me go back to it. I actually have it in front of me here. Okay. The second part was how do you think it shaped the methodologies and readings of the New Testament authors? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, maybe the examples I've given suggest the way that it did. I mean, the, the Exodus thing is really striking. Uh, that's a, it's a great example of that because uh, if you uh, look at um, the, in Luke's gospel, for example, uh, Luke 3, um, you get, uh, this is the, where you get the story about John the Baptist appearing in the wilderness preaching repentance, and it says, as it's written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill made low. Is, you know, you, we can all start humming the Handel's Messiah along with this, but it's uh, Isaiah, the Isaiah text is being evoked here as uh, a claim that's part of a whole theology of the new exodus that's going on in uh, in Luke, but uh, the Isaiah, see, as I said before, interprets the return from exile as a new exodus, and then Luke and Matthew, in particular in the Gospels, interpret Jesus, the, the salvation offered in Jesus, as a new, new exodus. Uh, Luke writes in, in Luke 9 about the exodus that Jesus was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of continued cycling of this typological pattern of God's reaching out uh, to redeem the people. So I think they learned that from the Old Testament. We could stay here all night if I read all these questions to we you. Could, and we're, not yeah. going, we're not going to. I'm going to ask you one more, and uh, then we'll wrap it up. If I don't get to your question, I'm sorry, but maybe you can stand at the end of the line where uh, Dean Hayes is signing books and uh, catch him or ask him the question there as you have him sign a book. Uh, do you believe, here's the last one, do you believe that God is actively threading modern day happenings in similar ways to 2 Kings 6 and Luke 24? God is actively threading, is that? Threading. The, threading. I've said that I believe that the God who is described in the Old Testament narratives is living and active. And, of course, that language of living and active is itself an echo of Hebrews, isn't it? Um, if that God is living and active, the same God that brought Israel out of Egypt, the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, the same God that poured out the Spirit on the church at Pentecost, the same God that has sustained the people of God to develop institutions as complex as the history of the church shows, yes, of course that God is living and active. And it would be shocking if that same God were actually not at work to create new events that would correspond to something like the pattern we see with Elijah, I'm sorry, Elisha in that story. The thing that's so striking to me is that we all spend so much time, in a sense, being like Elisha's servant. 
and feeling great anxiety that the forces that are surrounding us and opposing God's work are so overwhelming that we just feel like the roof is falling in on us. And Isaiah, I'm sorry, Elisha prays that the servant's eyes will be opened and he sees that he's surrounded by the heavenly hosts of angels and the chariots of fire. And you realize the gates of hell <laughs> are not going to prevail against us. The, the soldiers of the Arameans are not going to prevail against us. The Islamic State is not going to prevail against the kingdom of God. Whatever it is, we are in the hands of a God whose power is abundantly more than all we can ask or think. And so, indeed, we should expect that God still to be at work today, yes. Amen, amen.